Okay, I think we'll make a start. We're expecting another 25, 30 people to join us, which I'm sure they will soon. But can I just welcome you to what is the third EAL Quality Mark webinar um, with four relatively recently awarded um, gold EAL Quality Mark schools to talk to you. Just before we start, just a few housekeeping points. We are recording this. If uh, you don't want to be seen, turn your video off. Um, we suggest you view an active speaker view. We will. We plan to finish at five fifteen. The schedule gives us about fifteen minutes for questions at the end. The easiest thing is if you type them in the chat, and then we can take those first. Um, anything that we can't answer today, we'll try and answer in the follow-up communication you should get next week, um, where you'll also get the opportunity to see the, the video. Our webinars are not one night stands, they are relationships. And if for some reason something goes wrong and it drops out, just and it has done more than once in the past, just click on the link and we'll still be here one way or another and rejoin us. So if I can just start by saying a little bit about what we're gonna do. I'm gonna say a bit about the air quality mark. We'll then have four schools who've been through it, talk about it and about something they do um, particularly well, which we've primed them about. Um, I hope we can squeeze in a little bit of time for a really fantastic new book called Teaching EAL by Rob Sharples. So again, questions in the chat, please. So very briefly, we started the EAL Quality Mark because the EAL Academy was working with um, a, a medium-sized local authority. It had about 80 schools and we realized that there was some really good practice nobody knew about it. So other schools weren't going to see where there was good practice. So the quality mark was a way of defining and celebrating the good practice. Um, so people could go and visit schools that were doing well. And in fact, tomorrow I'm going to visit one of the schools that we found that way, which actually spoke at the, the first webinar. It has three sections, leadership and management, teaching and learning, parents and community, with 22 criteria at three levels spread across those sections. Teaching and learning is 10, it's almost half, and that's for an, an obvious reason. We ask you just to assess yourself against those criteria and give us some evidence, and then we visit. Um, two of the schools today, we've actually been able to go in person to do it. Two of them we had to do virtually because it, it was a bit too difficult to do in person. But whatever the format, really what we want to do is talk to people most, um, because we've already read the evidence. So we can talk that through, particularly keen to talk to parents and pupils as well as staff. A quick learning walk, then we'll just talk through the assessment with you. Usually we can make a decision on the day, sometimes we can't. Um, you get, uh, a certificate and a logo to put on your website and if you get the gold award we celebrate you on our website so um that's what it is and i'm now going to hand over to cassie williams from north ormsby primary school i should just say a word about north ormsby first um north ormsby is basically a very large and traditionally white working class council estate so how it's been able to cope with the AL pupils um, and make them very happy and successful is a fascinating story. This is also the only school where we've ever done the EAL quality mark where I made the head teacher cry. Because um, when I gave him the feedback, I said I'd asked him what, you know, a lot of them were kind of refugees. Their lives had not been great really until I started going to that school what they really thought about the school. And they just said, we feel valued and safe, which I think is 
the first place you have to be for any kind of effective learning. So over to you, Cassie. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> it's not ideal that you're going to make me cry before I uh, start presenting. Right. You'll have to forgive me. How do I actually present on this? Because I've just realised I'm on Zoom. Here we go. Yeah, you need to share your screen. Which might be at the top and it might be at the bottom. Yeah, good. Is that good, yeah? Yeah, and now you just need to open the PowerPoint. Yep, yeah, great. Okay. So, um, North Hampshire Primary School. We are quite a small primary school in Middlesbrough. We currently have 275 children, which has changed significantly since Graham visited us. And it was only at the end of the year um, that we did have that visit. <clears throat> we have a really high turnover of mobility here in North Armsby because of the nature of the housing that is just out of the back of school. Um, they are small terraced housing with primarily um, private landlords you, you know, I joke with um, assessors and, and people that visit us that, you know, if you give me 10 minutes, I could run out and get a set of keys. And, and I really could. And one, one day I am going to time myself how quickly I can do it. They don't need bonds, reference. Um, you know, the landlords want rent. So if they've got a tenant in, in their house, they're not entirely bothered what sort of tenant they might turn out to be. Um, because of that reason, of over the last two years, two to three years, I always forget about COVID, so you need to add that extra year on. Over the last three years, um, we have had a very high number of international new arrivals. Um, when that first started, it was primarily Romanian children, um, but that has changed dramatically of late. So when we started on our EL journey and we looked at the framework, we didn't actually believe that we were doing a lot. We didn't believe we were doing enough. Um, and the point of the journey for us was to find out what we can do better um, and where we can make those improvements. The, the self-evaluation framework, I would say, do it. If, you, if you're thinking about being on the journey, if, you, if you're questioning yourself, if you want to see where you can do better or what you feel as though you're not doing enough of, um, it was a really, really easy, great tool, actually, to open your eyes to what you are doing. Um, and then suddenly our gaps became obvious. It was quite clear um, that things around school our visual was great um, the learning was was embedded um, we have you know the different languages for dates and things all, all the multilingual books right throughout all of our bookcases um, we have young interpreters that I will come on to but that board that you can see there on the left that's displayed in our PE slash dining hall um, and what became apparent very quickly is if you cannot speak the language um, and you are put in a very large social situation with, without a familiar adult, it is extremely daunting. Um, so that board there is so that a child can, you know, grab a, a dinner lady, you know, anybody, even if they're not familiar to them, take them to this board and point out that person that they need. And that person, um, you know, hopefully the dinner lady will be familiar with that person because they've obviously been here a, a long period of time. Um, and that translator, that young interpreter can then come and support that child um, who obviously is having a bit of an issue and, and not really a great time of it at that point. Um, so yeah, so our journey um, really did take off in 2016, which is a little bit longer ago than, um, than the three years I talked about. It did start off quite slowly. However, the, the, you know, the getting off the ground, our AL children also. trebled in the space of a month. Um, yes. As Sorry. we've, Sorry. as I've meant... Uh, why am I here? Uh, I'm here to see you, but I'm going to go to Nanny's room and I'll be back later. Sorry, can somebody... Yeah. Thank you. 
thanks um we do have a lot of international new arrivals which i um which i've mentioned and that was the the first step i, I think on our journey that we really um knew we were doing it right the the paperwork was a very simple form that was designed by our local authority um, and it didn't take into account any international new arrivals any children with english as an additional language um so we we started there we gave our forms um a revamp put them in different languages um and it you know, it very quickly became apparent that we needed to learn about schooling that children had had in other countries. Um, some of the Romanians that were joining had, you know, we took for granted that they might have had some schooling in Romania. But actually, um, what transpired was they'd had quite a lot of schooling in Spain. Um, and some had even had some schooling in Spain and Germany. Um, some of these children that were joining, although English was an additional language, it wasn't even a second language to them. It was perhaps a third or fourth. Um, our prospectus that we gave them um, was woolly, I think is the best word. It was full of useless information. I'm sure you're all sat there thinking, yep, I've seen them. I know exactly what she's talking about. But it the information is useless. If you can't understand it, you know, with the best will in the world, don't put it in there. There's no point. Um, we made a very small succinct leaflet um which we were because it was so, so much smaller um, and only had the really important information in we we translated it into lots of different languages and we were able to give them that on their visit um on their visit they met their young interpreter their buddy somebody in their classroom they can go to um that might not be confident completely in the English language but certainly um had been through the process that they were about to go through um and understood how scary it is to be somewhat dumped in a in into a school full of strangers um that you don't understand um our young interpreters were key to our journey they they knew what them children were feeling they knew what they needed to do what to pass on um to ensure that the new children's english was picked up as quickly as it could be um and really that's been completely immersing them in the english language um and having them just can't you know just live it every day attendance has been um a really important factor and you know i speak quite regularly with some of our um roma travelers who um don't have the best attendance however you know recently we've um we've got a translator that visits them during coffee mornings and things um and and that message now is really starting to hit home about how quicker how much quicker the children will pick up the english language if they're in every day um and you know now we can get back to the inspired days and the open evenings and the afternoons and things they are really really taken aback with how much progress their children are making you know one of them translated to me that she would never have expected her child to be able to do the kind of work that he's producing at the moment and you know that really hits home to us how important it is um that what what we're doing is is tailored around children who need that english support um we joined the el hub which is a baseline assessment system um and from that our interventions resources and confidence really started to grow um and and so did the numbers let me tell you um today we have 96 children on roll we are only a small school so it works out to about 35 percent of um of children who have, have only been in the country less than two years we are fortunate enough to be an Apple Regional Training Centre, and it does mean that we can have one-to-one -one iPads right the way throughout school. Google Translate has been um, really useful on that, but also technology. It is a universal language, and children do really, really love it. So that is um, one of the most important things that I do tell schools that come to me and ask about support use the technology to your advantage um don't reinvent the wheel there's lots and lots of great apps out there that um a child who doesn't have English as their first language they can access really really quickly 
Graham did touch upon this earlier, um, but it is our our main point of a child that joins our school. Education is important, but here we we feel as though it's it's more important to understand the child. Um, English as an additional language isn't our only challenge. We have high numbers of deprivation. Um, you know, Middlesbrough has the highest suicide rate in in the UK. We have lots and lots of challenges. So it's really, really important to us. Our children feel safe, valued, understood, um, accepted, part of a, of a bigger family that they might not have at home, um, somewhere that they can come, be themselves and be really happy doing it. And I always say, you know, if we can crack that, then everything else will just follow. I feel as though parent relationships are equally as important as those children relationships. And, I, you know, parents feeling accepted and understood and heard um, is one of my biggest time consumers as part of my job. Um, I have coffee mornings, breakfasts, translation afternoons. Um, you know, I always make time on the yard at the end of the day to, to give a few mums the thumbs up and say, they're doing okay they're doing good um and just that reassurance really that the, the child is is actually fine and, and there's no need for them to worry which of course you do it, you know it's your child and you're handing them over to to a stranger who doesn't necessarily understand them um all of our communication uh where possible it is sent in multiple languages so our tech service had to be changed to accommodate this um and we are changing again but what we did say to our trust was we're not willing to do that unless um those text messages can continue we we feel as though you know them understanding the message that we send out is key to being um part of school and uh, we have a mascot tim um who was on our first on my first slide there um he is universal and his only job um, is to encourage students to be the best version of themselves at all times. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter what country you come from or what you've gone through or even what you had for breakfast that day. You come to school, and you need to be like Tim um, and, and master whatever, what ta whatever task you've been given. And that's that's really it from me. Um, I, I will hang around to the end if there's any questions being put in the chat for me. I'm I'm happy to answer them. Is that okay, Graham? Okay, our next um, speaker is Rachel, who is the head of New Marston Primary School in Oxford, which I um, was actually quality mark. I don't do that many quality marks, to be honest. A few other people in the team do them, but I have done the, the two um, that we're talking to first today. Um, I went there partly because many years ago, I lived in Marston for about two months during the summer. So it's nice to go back. Um, but did I go back or did I? No, I did it virtually, didn't I? I couldn't, that's sad. So I wanted to go back. But anyway, it was, it was really interesting. And I had some fascinating conversations with teachers about what they were doing, which I think is one of the things that drove the gold award. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, I will share my screen, so shout if um, this doesn't work. It's saying host disabled participant screen sharing. So if you, so if you could make me a um, screen, Graham, and I'll uh, our school for a minute. Um, we are in Oxford, and you might be able to tell from the accent I'm not from Oxford. Um, and you might think what I did, that um, moving to Oxford, you're going to get... Um, uh, a different type of school to what I was used to teaching in Manchester or in Rotherham. Um, and I was massively surprised when I arrived here. Um, New Marston is um, a city school, um, very close to the centre of Oxford. And we serve a very, very diverse population in, in every sense of the word. So 
about 29 languages spoken at our school. So, um, Rachel, you, you have got the brilliant, thank you. co-hosting now. Um, about 29 languages spoken in our school, and, and there's a real range within that of children. Um, there's probably about eight children at the minute in our school who have very little English, but actually a lot of the children here have some level of English, just not um, a fluent level of English. Um, you know, we, ha we have children of doctors that work at the local hospital that speak some English, and we have refugees as well. Um, so a real, real range of children um, who are, we have about 75% of our children are ethnic minority children. Um, we have high SEN numbers, high pupil premium numbers, um, and actually we have some children who are EL in the sense that they speak British Sign Language as their second language because we also host um, a resource base for deaf pupils. So that adds another dimension to the, the AL aspect of our school. Um, we, I, I feel very lucky we've kind of embedded um, a very relationships based approach to um, our school. Bear with me, let me just, it's hiding underneath the, um, the ID bit here. So bear with me a second, there we go. Um, there we go. Um, We've embedded a kind of nurture-based approach to our to our school. We're a very relationships-based approach. So my job today is not to talk about everything absolutely that I agree with with Cassie, and I don't want you to think that that we don't focus on that because we do. Um, my job today is to talk to you about how we plan for our EAL pupils. Um, I absolutely agree that relationships have to be right and that children have to feel safe and secure. Um, for us, we invested over the last few years a lot in teacher professional learning and development so that those children that had some level of English were very well catered for within the lessons, as well as some of our disadvantaged pupils where there was a word gap and some of our SEM pupils. So that's, that's my job to talk to you about today for um, five or six minutes. So... Um, I guess one of the biggest things that we have spent a lot of time on is vocabulary and planning for the vocabulary that children need to be discreetly taught to them. Um, so we did some CPLD with our staff using um, the word gap report um, written by Oxford University. And we really looked at how, how we could implement teaching of vocabulary and how we could plan for that. So what you can see on the screen now, and I've, I've, rather than use kind of explanations, I've kind of shared the live documents with you. Um, what you can see on the screen here is um, a medium term plan for geography, a unit of geography. And you can see in the top left box here, or the second box in, the key vocabulary. What our teachers do for every unit of work is they look at the tier one, two, and three vocabulary. Um, so we, the tier one vocabulary is pupils who are very new to English. They will need support to learn that, those vocabulary, those words, but most children will know them in year three. Um, the tier two vocabulary is usually um, technical language from previous years um, because we build on that year on year, but it may be the vocabulary that some of our children who have some English will need support with. And then our tier three language is your kind of exceptional language that's needed um, to really excel at that subject. So I guess the, the reason I'm showing this is if, if this is not planned and thought about before lessons start or before the unit starts, um, then, it, then it might not be included. Once we've planned our units, we then share knowledge organizers and we have two different types of knowledge organizers. So um, the unit that I was just showing you is a geography unit about weather and um, around the world, um, particularly Europe, this, this, this year, um, year group we're looking at. Um, and so for some of those children that need the tier one vocabulary um, explicitly taught, we would give a picture word match regardless of the age. And that's something I'll come back to in a little bit, the regardless of age. Um, this would go home to parents and it would go home before the term starts so that in advance, parents are able to talk to children about these words. Sometimes they are translated if that needs to happen, um, but not always. And the, the same word mat or knowledge organizer is available in the classroom for the unit. So 
for those children who are a little bit further on with their English um, and particularly where parents have got good levels of English this is a year four knowledge organizer um, I really benefit from this as a parent my child was learning all about the different names for rocks at Stonehenge and I wouldn't have known that as an English speaking parent but for some of our um, academics or doctors just to know what words we're going to be using and what what the children are really going to need you know if a child understands what flint is they're going to really be able to access the experience that we offer our children when we're making fires as part of our stone age topic so the top right box is something that goes home um, for those children in fact for all children other than those with new english um, or a lower level a, a less language once that vocabulary has been planned um, here, this is one lesson off a medium term plan, and I don't expect you to read it all now, um, but what's really important for us and what is now embedded is the vocabulary is not just at the top of the planning, it's, it is taught. So um, you will see that the first thing that after a review of previous learning is that we're going to talk about climates and it's planned to have a discussion about what that word means and explain it to the rest of the class. And if we need to put up some visuals, we will do that. Um, and again, it's planned that um, part of watching the video that we will address what the term weather means versus climate. So really, really unpicking the vocabulary and making sure that children understand it has been really key for us. And what then happens when we're implementing the practice is all of our vocabulary is placed up on a board and this runs right from reception up to year six. Um, the words are put on a grammar splat board and they are then referred to throughout. Now they're, they're ideally triple coded. Um, so this isn't a perfect display by any means, but by triple coded, I mean that they're, they're written, they're color coded by word class. And then for somewhere the children might be finding it quite tricky to understand, um, there's also a picture. So you can see on the word declared there, there's somebody stood on a, on a box explaining what um, they're declaring something and the children will come up with that image together. Um, and those will be up for the term. So this is year five at the minute and they're reading Beowulf. Um, so some of these words like rage have been discussed. Um, they're planned, they're discussed, and they're then used as kind of, um, if we've got five minutes at the end of the lesson, we might hand them all out and they'll give a clue and the other children will guess what word they're holding. Um, and they're also kept, you can see in the plastic wallet, so that we keep going back over the vocabulary that the children may not have known. So vocabulary is something that's really important to us. And the main thing I was gonna share with you today, but I have got a couple of other things in terms of, of what we plan. Um, so we use sentence stems across the school. If the children are in a maths lesson down in year two, um, there will be the same sentence stems in the middle of the table um, regularly for the children. So um, I know that is one of our sentence stems. I know that because is one that other children might use. Um, our partner, partners are very well planned. Um, we take time at the start of the term to plan who children are gonna be sat next to. Um, word maps I've talked about. The other thing that we do in our planning is we might um, speak to a child at the start of the lesson and tell them what question they're going to be asked and give them the coloured word card so that they have a clue as to what the answer might be about and that the child then isn't surprised um, but can rehearse the answer to a question. So that is planned as well. Um, two more things to share with you. Um, one is here, um, sentence then. So this is planned quite often in English for our children. Um, you don't need my Grammarly pop up there. Um, so we, um, this is when a group of children in year six were doing some descriptive writing. And um, this will be, the children have to be trained in using these, um, but along with the grammar splat words or the word mat, this is something that the children will have to be able to write a paragraph. So they will take one sentence um, and work along the chart and then they'll move down to the next one, which was about appearance and then one about behavior. And what we found is if children use these for six or seven lessons and then we take the frame away, some of the work that we've done has become embedded for those children. For those that need something a little less, that would be quite overwhelming for a year three. 
Um, so um, the year group that are looking at countries and capitals, again, just a simple writing frame is used like this um, for children. Um, again, it goes back to climate. Um, so this is this is what we would use in that instance. Um, planning in general, um, Cathy mentioned it, visuals are really key for us. You can see here words again being used in English, um, grammar black colours, um, triple coded. This is current. I've just taken this today. They're reading Frankenstein in year three. Um, so we have very ambitious texts for our children. Um, but with, the, with that visual the timeline, um, this really has helped our children to be able to retell the story. Um, so this is really strong modelling for us um, that the children can, can use and, and, and it's great scaffolding tools for them. Um, the only other thing that I was going to say is as well as visuals, you know, we really don't underestimate the value of manipulatives for children, particularly in math or in topic lessons. I think that um, regardless of age, this is what I was coming back, coming on to um, earlier, year sixes are used to getting out every bit of maths equipment that they need and using it. So it's not, oh dear, you need the word cards, oh dear, you need the um, the um, deans, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it really is embedded through our school. Um, and finally, um, we do plan for very specific pupils. We have these as kind of whole class initiatives, but we do pop the name of specific, specific pupils on our planning so that if there is a brand new child, we are tailoring and personalizing those lessons to our children. Um, it, you get quicker at this. Again, we've put a lot of CPLD in for staff to support this. Um, but if, if staff know what tools are available to them, then we have found that they um, are um, finding it much easier to do. And it, it's not taking the time that it, it may have done before. Um, so that is it from me. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I must say, we were asked to, to talk a little bit about um, why we did the EAL award and for us we really wanted that professional audit we wanted or I wanted as a school as a new head to the school um, I'd been the deputy here and I'd been the inclusion coordinator but I just wanted that feel for, for what we needed to be doing next for our families um, and for us it really threw up something quite important as a head teacher um, we had a lot of ethnic minority pupils but Graham picked up that there was quite a disparity between the ethnic minority pupil numbers and the EAL numbers. And he was saying, surely more of these ethnic minority pupils must be EAL. And that has massive implications in terms of census data and funding in schools. Um, so, you know, that was really a really, and sometimes you just need that fresh pair of eyes to see things. So that was really helpful. Um, and, and now as a result of the quality mark and the audit, we're monitoring the take up actually this year of the personal development opportunities we have in school enrichment and things just to make sure that all groups are represented in that. Um, so two really valuable things with more as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. I just thought that was, that was excellent because it's the detail of what you actually do with children in classrooms, which is what people always ask us for in events like this. And I particularly like your stress there on planning who works with whom. The time you invest in that it is really, really effective. So thank you. I'm sure there'll be some questions at the end. And we'll be able to share those slides with people, I hope. So they've got that detail. OK, the, if I go back to my presentation. As I said, the International School Park City are, I hope, all in bed by now, but they have um, sent us a video about what they do. So let's hope all the technology works and this plays and you can hear it. Hello and greetings from the International School at Park City Kuala Lumpur. I'm Gary Crick, I'm the Head of Learning Sports here at ISPKL, responsible for our EAL programme. 
apologies that I can't be with you in person. Uh, your webinar is starting about half past midnight our time, which kind of makes things a little bit impossible uh, for us to join. A little bit of context about our school. We are an all through school. Graham, we've lost the sound. Could you unmute yourself? We were founded in 2011 and we have approximately a thousand students. Um, and we've got quite an even split between Malaysian students and international students. Uh, and around 50 different nationalities are, are represented at the school. At Park City Kuala Lumpur. I'm Gary Crick. I'm the head of learning sport here at ISPKL, responsible for our EAL program. Apologies that I can't be with you in person. Uh, your webinar is starting about half past midnight our time, which kind of makes things a little bit impossible uh, for us to join. A little bit of context about our school. We are an all through school. We have students that start at the age of three in our early years centre, uh, and they can progress right the way through to A levels. Uh, we're located about 10 kilometres northwest of uh, the Twin Towers in KLCC. We were founded in 2011 and we have approximately a thousand students. Um, and we've got quite an even split between Malaysian students and international students. Uh, and around 50 different nationalities are, are represented at the school. We have a significant number of bi and trilingual students and, and a few that speak four or five different languages. We are a fee-paying school, uh, and that means that we do uh, also have a paid EAL program, which enables us to employ uh, our five EAL teachers. Uh, we have uh, two in primary, one in Key Stage 1, one in Key Stage 2, uh, and three in our secondary school, uh, who also work within our English department. Uh, and as I said, we're founded in 2011, uh, celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year. Now, why the EAL quality mark? Well, there's several reasons, really. Uh, first, two members of our EAL team underwent the EAL Academy online course uh, and found that a fantastic resource. Uh, and we're able to disseminate the information with the rest of our uh, school staff here in, in KL. The second was that I underwent an internal EAL review, looking at many different areas of EAL, and really wanted some confirmation that what we were doing was right for our students. So working with, with Graham in the EAL Academy seemed a natural fit. Um, it was an opportunity to develop the uh, quality mark for an international community uh, and international schools. Uh, and so we embarked on working with Graham to do that. And that involved um, working with the criteria, amending some of them so that they would fit uh, an international school uh, mode, um, and, and then generating the evidence against that criteria. Uh, we underwent a virtual accreditation visit when Graham visited, speaking to myself, our principal. Uh, and other members of staff, and we were delighted to become the uh, first international recipient of the EAL Quality Mark at Gold level. And of course, we shared that uh, news quite wide widely. It was on the EAL Academy website, on our own media platforms, and also on the Federation of British International Schools in Asia uh, website, uh, and hopefully it's generating some interest in the Quality Mark uh, across Southeast Asia and beyond. So what do we do well? in terms of EAL. Well, I've broken this down into three areas in the EAL quality mark. In terms of leadership and management, we do have dedicated EAL lead, myself and EAL staff. We certainly have buy-in from school leaders. We're a very international community uh, who are used to EAL students. Uh, we have quite high mobility. We have lots of students arriving during the school year and lots of students disappearing uh, to other schools, other countries, uh, again, throughout the year. Um, so we are used to welcoming new EAL families uh, quite frequently. I think we have good data on EAL students. We know where they are when they arrive. We're able to assess their proficiency and put in relevant support. As I said, we're a very diverse uh, and very community focused school. Uh, and sharing with you, uh, one of these er events is our International Day where we celebrate every single nation, a parade of nations where we invite our students to, and, and parents to dress up uh, in their national dress and, and parade uh, around our school uh, AfroTurf. In terms of working with parents in the community, 
Um, we do work very closely. We are a holistic school community. It's really important for us that staff, parents, and students all work together. We certainly celebrate diversity. Uh, we have a number of celebrations across the year. We celebrate all of these different festivals, many of which are public holidays uh, here in Malaysia. Um, you'll notice that there are Hindu, uh, Christian, and Islamic festivals and Buddhist festivals. Uh, and this is a picture of our China, Chinese New Year celebrations when we always have a lion dance in school. Another area that we do well in teaching, learning and assessment, uh, the cultural and social experience of our students is very explicit in our curriculum. We have regular days such as International Day. We celebrate the, the festivals I spoke about previously. We share data not only on EAL students, but on all of our students, their nationality, uh, other data that is relevant so that we can build on that in, within our curriculum. And I think we have an expectation in the school that every teacher is a teacher of language. We know that a number of our students are bilanguage and that they're always developing uh, vocabulary, they're always developing their linguistic skills. And this is really quite prominent. Every teacher does teach language, whatever subject they're teaching and in whatever stage of the school. We do focus EAL teaching for all of our teachers. We do expect that, particularly with a large number of bilingual students. We make sure that's emphasized in CPD and training. We make sure that is regular and timely. We don't have one-off session in INSET. We make sure we build on, on what we deliver to our staff, uh, and we make sure we have regular and timely. Uh, so it isn't just one or two sessions. We build each year, we build each term on what we deliver and the support that we offer. And we are able to offer quite a lot of support with five EAL teachers who not only teach our lower uh, English level students, but they also provide support to teachers, provide resources. Uh, and here's an example of one of our, one of our science labs uh, in work. As a school, we're also looking forward all the time. We are certainly forward-looking school we're all we know that we are growing uh, within our township we know there are there is growth there is a lot of building work going on condos are growing we're having another thousand residents uh, residences opening in in the next few months uh, and another thousand within the next couple of years so we know the school is going to grow uh, we've identified many areas in our EAL review and our accreditation where we can develop our EAL vision uh, and these are some of them areas uh, this is our brand new primary school. This is currently being built uh, and will open in April 2022 uh, as we move to a sixth form entry school. Uh, very, very brief overview of, of, of our EAL program here at I ISP. Uh, there are my contact details if anyone does want to get in contact for more information uh, and how this would work in an international school. Thank you. Okay, so thanks to Gary. That um, I have to say that was I seem to be echoing. Not sure why. That was um, the only quality mark we've ever done at six o'clock in the morning because it was the only time we could talk to lots of people in the school because um, it's so far ahead of us time wise. Um, our next. Um, school is Chilton High School. So we've had two primary schools and all through school. Now we're going to get a secondary school. So if I can hand over to you, Susanna. That'd be great. Can you hear me? Yeah. That's great. Sorry, I've had issues with the sound today. Um, Graham, could you make me a co-host? Because I've had to uh, leave and come back because of my sound issues. So I'll just tell you a bit about um, our school while we just hang on. Um, for me uh, to become a host so I can share my screen. I'm Susanna Haygarth. I work at Chalton High School, there's my camera, um, which is in South Manchester. So we're a, um, a very much um, a city centre school. Um, we kind of think of ourselves as um, a microcosm of Manchester, really. So whatever is happening in Manchester will be represented in our school. So we're 
Um, we've got 1,500 students from 11 to 16. Um, and within that, we have quite a stable EAL cohort um, numbers wise, but we found that that cohort, those numbers, it is starting to change. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so um, what I thought in this five minutes is that we could do three things. So the first thing um, I thought um, I would explain why we chose to undertake the quality mark assessment, what we gained from the assessment, and then how we meet, assess and integrate our international new arrivals. Um, so when we look at why we chose to undertake the quality mark assessment, as I said, we do have a stable local cohort of bilingual students. So around a quarter to a third of our students, it can fluctuate year on year, confirm that they are EAL. More are EAL, but don't confirm with the school. So uh, we always do a little bit of digging with that, um, but around a quarter to a third. Um, our cohort of international new arrivals, however, has increased and diversified and is continuing to do so. So since about 2016, 2017, we had, um, on average, we have very small numbers, about six international new arrivals per year maximum. Um, and now in the last um, two months, we've had over 40. So it's been a huge change for us. It's been a gradual change. Uh, since about 2016-17, um, but now it, it is a significant shift. What we've done between about 2017 and last year is we developed our EAL provision. So we developed a hub, like a school within a school approach, and it indicated to us that it was successful, but we needed to confirm that by using an external assessment process. So um, listening to the other speakers from primary schools, um, what our assessor Chiaka said was that she was uh, pleasantly surprised at how we had a similar approach to a primary school. So we were very family oriented, very, um, we, we were focused very much on students fee and families feeling like they belonged. So we have a base in the school building where the students are based when they first arrive and we meet their parents and their parents become part of our family too and then the students gradually um, attend mainstream lessons. So what we gained from the quality mark assessment was the first thing was the framework was rigorous I found. I had to work hard to make sure that my evidence was collated um, and that I was sure of each piece of evidence um, and that that meant um, I had to be organised, it had to be wide ranging and I had to be ready for any questions. Um, what I needed to do, and this was really useful for me as a leader, was I had needed to bring all our evidence together. And that brought in all the different elements of school to make a cohesive picture. So we work with the attendance team, we work with heads of department, we work with our safeguarding department. We work with our heads of year and I had to bring all that together on one piece of paper. And that was really useful for me to map what we were doing um, to make it tangible. Um, and because I have kind of driven this um, to be um, a standalone department within school. So that was really interesting to have it written down. Um, it meant I had to be organised, but I had to collaborate. And we've always done that, and it just formalised it in a really useful way for me. Um, for my staff, we're lucky, we're really well resourced. We have um, lots of space, we have lots of people. Um, and what happened with the quality mark is as we were putting it together as a team, it built our confidence um, in what we were doing, but it also tested that confidence during the interview and assessment process, um, because um, we thought we were ready, we thought what we were doing was good, and then to have an external person ask us about that um, was really useful. It raised the profile of the whole school work we do, so it gave my staff confidence in, in leading what they were leading, and it gave staff more, you know, more confidence if they needed it, 
um, in working with us and collaborating because um, at a huge secondary school that is under lots of different pressures, you've got to make sure that um, each individual student is getting what they need. And so that can be quite a challenge and therefore it requires a huge amount of goodwill and collaboration. Um, and that's what we were able to show, which was just fantastic. Um, it allowed us to reflect on our development and processes. Um, I've been head of different departments within three different schools over 20 years and building this from scratch was one of the most challenging things I've done. And so um, to be able to reflect on that with my staff and with an external assessor um, pointed out what we were doing really well and then where we needed to go next. So that was really useful for me. So just to zoom in on um, how we work with our international new arrivals, our system is based on information from Solihull Local Authority um, who have been doing this brilliantly for years, as I'm sure a lot of people attending this webinar have. Um, we work with two local secondary schools um, who have experts in, um, in welcoming new arrivals because they have much bigger numbers than us and they've been brilliant in sharing best practice. Um, so what we do, we meet um, the student and their family with the head of year at admissions meetings. Then we agree a start date so we can be prepared. It sounds like a tiny thing, but in a big secondary school, when things are moving very quickly, you have to know who is starting and when. And to an extent, we need to control that. So we have timetables ready. We have everything that student needs ready um, so we can, uh, that we have the right staff available um, because of course every student is different and they're all going to need something slightly different and I think primary schools get that right and I think in a secondary school it can be quite a challenge um, to get that right for individual students um, so to it sounds really tiny but to have an agreed start date that we have suggested helps us be ready so the smoother the start the better the experience for everyone on their first day, we meet them and then they have a tour of the school with a native speaker. Um, we use the Young Interpreters Scheme 2 at secondary school and um, it's, been a, it's been an absolute pleasure to watch our students um, revel in the use of their um, first language or sometimes second language, sometimes third language as they give tours with us. Um, I'm going to show you our welcome assessment that we do because what we do is we gather all sorts of information about individual students and their circumstances and their family circumstances which then is passed to their teachers and this is vital in integrating a student into our school community. Um, we assess their language and I'll show you that in just a minute and then that language assessment um, then leads to next steps. So we use the um, scale of language acquisition, so A, B, C, D, E, that the government used a few years ago for the census, but now they don't. We still use that because it means that as a staff, we have a common language when we talk about students. So we would be able to send an email to all staff to say, we've got a new student, they're assessed at an A, um, please check your lists. You know, if you teach them, get in touch. And all teachers will know what that means. Um, the level of intervention each individual student gets depends on what where they are assessed on that level and so we have a um which is no english but they can still be an a plus which means that they do understand some and then a b which is early acquisition again they can be b minus equals or plus and then a c developing competence and then a d competent and an f and an e fluent so depending on how we assess them on that first day, um, and then again in the next few weeks as they build their confidence, that, um, that then um, leads to what kind of intervention they get. Maybe they stay in our hub all the time because they're an A and they would rather stay with us and we're lucky enough to be able to staff that until they're ready to go into mainstream. We're lucky enough to be able to staff a transition to mainstream supported by teaching assistants. Um, maybe they go straight into mainstream, maybe they're a, B, a high B or a C, maybe they're confident, maybe they've got lots of native speakers around them, and so they'll go in with differentiated work. Um, and of course, we, um, because every student is different, 
they might need differing levels of pastoral support. A lot of student use our, students use our hub um, as a base, but go to all their mainstream lessons. So they come to us um, for a place to leave their bag, maybe. Maybe they have their lunch with us. And that's just a lovely um, thing for us to be able to do. So if I just show you um, this international new arrival form, this is our welcome form. And as you can see, um, we this is a blank example at the top. As you can see, this is um, someone who joined us from Syria. So we put, um, we recognize that they will speak, a lot of our students speak multiple languages. Last year, I was working with a student on her Italian GCSE who spoke six languages. And you just would never have known if we, um, didn't work with them on the additional languages GCSEs. It was brilliant. We also Susanna, don't, can I just yeah. a we can't see that form. We can see oh, your slides. Have. Let me do it now. Let me do it now. There you go. You can see it now. Yeah. Yeah, that's working. Yeah. Um, so um, we also recognise that they have uh, perhaps a different country of origin to where they uh, last lived, and then we put some language on there. And then we ask these questions. So who are they with in the UK? Do they speak English at home? Who's in the country um, of origin? What previous experience do they have of the English language? What previous schooling? What interest, skills and talents? And then what are their plans for the future? Uh, we do this often with a translator, sometimes with a young interpreter, sometimes with Google Translate. And then as I scroll down, you'll see um, one of the staff will um, assess them and give um, other teachers um, really clear information and targets that this student is working on. Um, if I just show you what those assessments look like, this is for students who, um, who perhaps will be level one or two, so level A or B. We just have a very, very simple story. I'll just, scre uh, just scroll through and they have to answer very simple questions. It is sometimes um, they will write or sometimes we will scribe for them just to get any thoughts down. Sometimes um, we would translate the whole story into um, first language to see what happens and um, if that works best for that student. And then um, if they are clearly quite competent at English, they will have a slightly more difficult text. Um, and then again, same kind of question. So summary, um, comprehension, a bit of inference, um, and then some writing. And what we find is those assessments are tried and tested and they tend to lead us straight to um, whether that student is an A, B or a C. Um, and then that means we can plan their interventions really well. Okay, uh, that's it from me. I hope that was useful. Thank you, Graham, for inviting me to speak. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, I really like the de the organisational detail you've got in there. It's really helpful. And if we have time after the next speaker, I'm going to ask you about funding and how you come to be well resourced, because that's always a, a difficult issue in EAL to get the level of resourcing that you need. Um, so I'm about to talk to Rob Sharples. I just want to show you a slide. OK, Rob, if you're there, we're both here. I won't show the side with the cover of your book. No, oh, I've got one of those. Uh, you've you, got one of those. Am you I able to share it. my screen? Right, let's see how this goes. Uh, just let me give you that. Let me find you. Okay, um, yeah, you should be able to share it now. There we go. Lovely. Well, look, uh, first of all, what, what an incredible um, group of people. I'm, I'm sort of um, inspired and intimidated by all the speakers so far, just to, to hear the things that you're managed to, to get going. 
Uh, my um, perspective is a bit different. I'm uh, an academic working with um, language and, and the movement of young people, and particularly what happens when these, these globally mobile young people reach these organisations we call schools, because there's so often such a conflict that, that is really hard to reconcile between what the young people bring in and what the education system asks of us. And, and just hearing from people who are bringing it together and, and putting these things into practice is, is incredible. So Graham asked me to talk a little bit about the book. So um, I, I kind of describe myself in the, the broader terms because EAL is a really tricky thing to define. Um, what I've tried to do with the book is just to um, put the evidence at the service of practice. That is to say that rather than saying this is how you, you teach EAL or this is what you need to do, this is the simple answer, here we go, and we get plenty of that coming at us, um, to rather more slowly, I think, say that you've got a series of really complicated decisions to make, and you can only make those decisions well if your if your professional practice is informed by what we know in a number of areas so the book's divided into three sections the first section is what we know about how young people acquire additional languages and that word additional is really important because most cpd around el acquisition really focuses on the first language and sort of ports it over to second language so we spent quite a bit of time actually talking about right what's happening when your children are in the classroom and they're exposed to all the language um, and that rich environment that people have described, what's happening for them and how can we make that process more effective for them? The second part of the book is all about how language works across the curriculum. And it's that idea that really everybody um, needs to know about how language works in their classroom or in their subject or discipline. The EL specialist needs to know how language works across the curriculum. So this gives, a, I think, a really clear guide to those different dimensions of what's happening in different subjects. And one of the reasons I think that's really valuable is because it puts EAL and subjects and class teachers on a really equal footing. So often, um, I think language is seen as a support rather than an integral part of all teaching and learning for all pupils. And there's this really interesting data that, that I talk about in the book and elsewhere, wherever I go, I talk about this. We're beginning to get a picture that monolingual English speaking pupils do better in classrooms with lots of EL learners. There's lots of caveats that go with it, but it's data like that that I think is really, really important because it shows that what EAL teachers do, making the language of the classroom explicit, making learning transparent, having those really high aspirations, they really benefit all pupils. So understanding how languages or additional languages are acquired is really important. Knowing how language works across the curriculum is crucial. And then the third part is how you put it into practice. And Graham's given me eight or 10 minutes, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, I, I love this slide because it's got all the nice things people say um, about the book, including I stuck, a, stuck Graham's review of the book on the bottom there. Um, no one's ever said that anything I've written is hard to put down before. Um, hard to stay awake through if you've read some of my academic papers, um, but hard to put down is lovely. Now I've got to live up to that, of course. So for most of us, it's really interesting that, that Graham mentioned the challenge of being over-resourced. Um, I think the challenge for, for most schools that I, that I talk to and I work with is the challenge of building the long-term sustainable EL support that each of our speakers today has shown. But in a fast changing and often under resourced setting, when the urgent often threatens to overwhelm the important. And I think one of the real challenges around, around high quality EAL is keeping your eyes on the long term goal of, of a language rich curriculum for everybody that really turbocharges the learning of bilingual pupils and, and keeping progress towards that goal when, as people have described, when, when the context can change suddenly and, and your number of new arrivals can triple in a month and, and you know, so on and so on. So the, the approach that for me, and I've put my contact details at the bottom, is, um, is to think about evidence-based EAL. What does that mean for us? How do we put that evidence at the service of practice? So, um, I'm going to talk about one aspect of that today, which is a, a CPD strategy for EAL. Um, we don't talk very much about evidence-based CPD in, in strategic terms, in the long term. 
actually has been a number of projects over the past 10 or so years. So a big workforce review in 2009, um, two uh, big reviews published in the EL Journal. If you're not members of now, you definitely should be. They're lovely people and EL Journal is a fantastic resource. Um, there's been some further work in the US that's quite relevant, although the context is different. And all the research points us to a number of principles that good EAL CPD, building capacity in your school, is going to focus on building capacity in individual participants, by, by which we mean teachers across the school. So it's not just about um, you know, a, a few techniques for, for developing vocabulary, but it's about the deeper understanding and ability to act of all teachers. And we know that good CPD for EAL is sustained and closely tied to what participants do in their work and also connected to the broader themes. So that's that, that theory practice challenge that we know that, that twilight CPD sessions are, you know, occasionally helpful, but also quickly forgotten. And that good CPD for EAL, as we've seen in all these, these presentations, and as we see really clearly through the quality mark, and I, I was really interested um, to hear that the self-assessment framework was exactly that. It was connecting those, those bigger picture ideas to the day-to-day -day practice and, and working rigorously over a period of time to achieve it. So we know that's important, but crucially it's got to involve everyone. It, it can't be EAL specific. So one thing that an EAL framework, sorry, a CPD framework for EAL would include is a really clear focus on who's responsible for EAL at a leadership level. If no one in the school leadership team is taking explicit and public responsibility for EAL, then, then you know, how far can you go? So upward management tends to be quite important. And that then flows down to everyone. So the point of, of a, a CPD strategy to build that across the school, we know from the examples we've seen today, but also from a broader evidence base, is it's school level work that equips everyone to take responsibility. So I feel a bit... Uh, it feels a bit luxurious to have 10 minutes just to talk about um, the book itself. Um, so here's a couple of examples of how we do that. So there's 17 um, really concrete activities. And I, I wrote these into the book because I, I got a bit fed up um, of um, like practical activities in, in books for teachers. And it's all about think for pupil, reflect upon them. Isn't it interesting? There's nothing you can get your teeth into with that. And then I realised why they're all like that. It's because book publishers put them in. So when I started publishing you know, chapters in, in handbooks for primary and secondary teachers and so on, um, the, the publisher would just think that everyone wants them and would just insert them into your chapter in a couple of cases uh, with a few errors in, which led to an interesting conversation. So the 17 tasks in, in the third part of this book are all about... Um, making a really concrete path from um, being given the role with nothing, you know, no experience or, or um, expertise in the EAL, but a, a desire to do something valuable and building up to the point where your school is a beacon for other schools and you're sharing your practice, you're contributing to the evidence base um, yourself. So one example of that quite late in the process is how to map out an EAL strategy and it talks about finding EL interested colleagues who can you work with who can you help to um, develop these ideas with so not just keeping it all in the EL team that there's that, that idea of a dependency culture almost that, that comes about sometimes if it's all on the shoulders of the EL person um, but also colleagues who haven't given it a moment's thought but might be interested and then think about well in your school how does that work how how does your expertise as a group of people um, meet the challenges that your school faces. So you can do that through the quality market. It's, it's a terrific thing to do, but you can also do it um, over coffee. If you take six break times, one a week across a term, and the three of you sit down and make some notes, you, you'll get, you know, a huge amount out of just that. And then we, you know, we start working out these CPD plans and, and they could be lists of bullet points to go away and look up or or specific courses that people want to take but what's crucial here is every time you're running it past people you're asking does this work for you and and the the key principle of the book is that idea of putting the evidence at the service of practice you don't want anyone coming in telling you this is what you should do you 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 hopefully from the book we'll, we'll get um well 
and the, the head of EAL in Glasgow called it your new EAL best friend. And I, and I hope it's it's a, um, a really supportive uh, thing to have with you. Ideas that, that you can actually rely on that will help you develop your own principles for practice. I think the, the examples we've seen in the speakers today are just phenomenal. I think for a lot of us, I feel almost inaccessibly good. So, so this is meant to be um, a way of, of getting us there. And I'll just sketch out very briefly how that looks in practice. So the first stage is just getting to know your school, thinking about what assessments work for you, because we know that that kind of information is really, really important. And then we might think about the students coming into the school. And, and the reason the students come slightly later is that, that attempt to make it longer term and better sustain. If the first thing we think is about the student arriving this morning, then we've really got no hope of, of putting long-term sustainable provision in place because it's always about the student arriving today and there'll always be a student arriving today. So finding time to actually critique with a, with a, a, a realistic, um, hopefully very friendly framework for doing so means that, that you are supported to put that in, uh, in place for your learners. As time progresses then, that, that network and, and networks like this I think are really important eventually get to the point where, where you're leading. And, and I think this idea of a language leader doesn't mean you're necessarily an EAL lead. Anyone can be a language leader. And if you've got people who feel that their responsibility is to lead language, rich curriculum language in their subject area, and you're the EAL lead uh, responsible for that, we, you know, that's a terrific job. And we, we talk in a book about the idea of different types of leadership, um, particularly positional leadership, where you, where you have maybe a management position um, and you're responsible for the work of others. And if they don't do the work right, then, then there's trouble. But also, which can happen at the same time, that idea of personal leadership, that, that you're responsible to the work of others, that their success is the measure by which you think of your own success and your own work. So that really works well for EAL. And it, it, it's, it's simple, concrete, evidence-based, really accessible strategies for building up great EAL provision um, across the school. So recapping uh, briefly, things that I hope the book will offer, just evidence informs what works. But more than that, if, if it gives you tools to think about why, then that's building up your, your professional power. Um, if you only get what works, then, then it's, you know, it's always about implementing someone else's ideas rather than having that for yourself. And I think that's the key to, to specialist professional learning that we've seen today. Um, and I think it's got to be, you know, that there's not a really, really rich, um, robust and, and prestigious career framework that will take you through as an EL specialist to, to that really high level of practice. Um, bear with us. We're, we're really trying to build those courses um, uh, and, and build those qualifications. And the quality mark is a big part of it. But I think, you know, join your subject association, come to webinars like this. And, and as you know, I think that's that's what starts to, to get us there. So I hope the book is useful to people. I will stop sharing my screen so I can see everyone again. Thank you um, very much. Hopefully that, that gets us there. Yeah, thanks a, a lot for that. Um, I really do recommend the book to people. It's, it's well written. It's easy to read. Um, it's well organised. It's very easy to follow the logic of the argument in it as well as just to take each individual chapter deals with something and you could just read that bit if that's something you're particularly interested in. Um, we are slightly over time. If there are any questions, we might have five minutes. Um, or we could say, if you put your questions in the chat, we will get the appropriate person to answer them. Um, if that might work a little better. I haven't actually seen any, any questions in the chat. So I think people may want to reflect. We will try and tell you when we've edited the video so you can have another look and send you the slides from today. But if you, if you want to send in questions and you do it in the next couple of days, we'll try and get the answers to you with the other stuff that we send uh, next week. So 
can I conclude by just saying thank you to all of our speakers. Um, they've given us a lot of their time. They've given us insights into their schools and their expertise, which I personally have found very, very valuable. I've, I've worked in the EAL world for a long time. I know sometimes it seems a bit of a lonely place where people don't listen to you. And they're not very interested, but today's been a gathering of people who are interested, interesting, and uh, making really important changes. So I just kind of like to have a little round of virtual applause for them all. And uh, I can see I've actually got a clap, that's good. Um, so I think we will close the webinar now. Um, I hope to see you all again soon. We, we do these regularly because lots of schools are now doing the air quality mark. And the ones that do it very well, we really do want to share what they do. So we, there will be another one next year. Um, and if you're lucky enough to live near Newcastle, there will be a live one there next June, um, which I hope you heard, Cassie, because you're not so far away, we might want you to come and talk at that one. Um, so thanks very much. Goodbye to everybody. I, to, just if the speakers can hang on for a bit so we can just check with them what we're doing next in the follow-up from this. Okay, goodbye.